I'm Eileen Serlin, and you all know that half of this work is improvisation, so we've already started. I'm your um, dance therapist, expressive therapist, trainer once a month. From my point of view, the fields of expressive therapies, creative arts therapy, I'm a dance therapist, are a little confusing. So let me just explain a little bit about where I come from so you can know. I did supervise here about 25 years ago in the expressive therapies. Um, but I'm not an expressive therapist. I'm actually a dance therapist, um, although I use music and art, and you'll see that too. Um, I was in the first, I came out here in 1969, 1970 to work with Anna Halpern. So any of you familiar with Anna Halpern's work? That's definitely expressive therapy. She goes a lot from moving um, uh, words into images and movement and then back to words again, dancing, drawing, drawing, dancing. It's kind of like that. Um, and then I was in the first class at NYU and then Hunter College in New York of dance therapy. Got funded for a master's program that I graduated in 1973. So in those days, they were separate fields. We had dance, the creative arts therapies had their own disciplines, had their own training, had their own journals, and still do, associations. So if you see art therapy, and we have our own registry. So I'm a BC DMT, board certified dance movement therapist, which is a master's plus two year supervised experience plus exams. In that training, we got a lot of things that I'll share with you. We had a lot on kinesiology. This is our tool, so we danced and learned about the body. Um, if there's some confusion about whether dance therapy is a somatic therapy, it is, but it's also, and from my perspective, more of a creative arts therapy, and in some places it's in an arts department. I think it's both, but it's bodily based, very much so. Um, we spent a lot of time learning nonverbal communication in the 70s. That's part of what I'll bring you. There's a literature on nonverbal communication. So sometimes dance therapy isn't doing anything. It's just sharpening your skills for observation. That's everything from the interpersonal space between patient and client to your own body language. We went through an, a nonverbal analysis, just like verbal, so we know our own strengths and weaknesses and, and kind of um, inclinations. And as you develop your own personal style, this is the instrument. So a lot of work with us is, is our bodies. Um, I'm a folk dancer, so it started in 1962 in Israel. I still go and uh, do a lot of training in Israel. I've been going every year and, and um, been doing now trainings abroad. Be going to China in um, October and Istanbul in February. Um, for me, dance is cross-cultural by definition. So we'll be working with some things that because you can meet people non-verbally. I heard that question come up earlier about what happens if so-and-so doesn't speak. So for me, non-verbal is a big way to reach people. And it's an amazing experience to go into some village in the middle of Turkey and right away know the music, the dance, and the, um, and the um, traditions. So the roots, images of dance therapy, that article that I passed around, did you get it? Finally, there was a lot of back and forth about that. That sort of talks about ancient healing roots of dance, rituals in a group in the psychiatric hospital. And I worked with children, with autistic children, and I worked in nursing homes for three years using movement. So I'll talk about that a little bit. But rituals of greeting, hellos and goodbyes, we had one here, often in movement, really begin and end. Some of the more archetypal forms that are standard pretty much across all cultures, like the use of the circle, um, in and out of the circle, certain things that show up in all folk dances are really universal forms of creating harmony, creating connections and groups. So my own particular way of working with dance therapy draws on folk dance a lot. Um, I've worked with people with strokes and wheelchairs, but there's always something you can do. Um, we heard in the earlier, I think it was Joanne was saying, um, people should be visible. So when, when I worked with people with strokes, we put um, little bells, instruments on people, because when you start feeling invisible, you can hear yourself or you can hear yourself. It's another way to say I am and I'm here. So a lot of times using weight, um, rhythm to really uh, do that. You'll see on what I wrote on the board kind of spontaneously, connection is important and structure. So depending upon how um, 
how disorganized a group is, and backward chronic psychiatric hospitals can be pretty disorganized places. Um, the more disorganization, the tighter the structure to create safety. You've heard of words like container, safety, all that. In dance therapy, it's physical. You actually create your circle. You walk it. You mark it. You mark the inside and the outside of the circle. I'll demonstrate some of these things. If you can have a circle, but a circle does lots of things. It's um, democratic. It's, you know, it, it, it spreads the leadership around, which is eventually something you want to do. There's an, uh, a center and a periphery. So right away, you're, you're helping people focus. It's really helpful with dementia. With I used to stand in the middle of the circle. I'll demonstrate all these things with a little soft ball and just say, good morning, Robin. And you might throw it back. Good morning, Lee? Lily. Lily. Can't quite see. And you'd throw it back. So you're making eye contact. But again, you're using props. You, but always in service of. So there's no formula so much as there are these kinds of principles that I'll be talking about. So that was nonverbal communication in the 70s. And I did work children. So I worked with autistic children who didn't have language. I worked with delinquent kids. And if any of you do that there, it was a, a lot of strong rhythm helped them like go into a, we'd use drums so they could run into a gym and then hyperactive and then re-harness that energy into something more organized, then let it get chaotic again, then bring it back. So whatever the defining problem is, you're using music, you're using rhythm, you're using weight, those are your main techniques, really. Um, my first training was with Laura Pearls at the Gestalt Institute. So she and I would then translate, which is a lot of the work that I do, I don't know if you can hear so much, if somebody's coming up with a, um, a verbal issue, you can translate it into movement and, and play it out in movement. So it's like role play, but it's a little more abstract than that. I just came back, I was just at NYU last week and we were working with a group, the social work school of Taiwanese social workers. And we were role playing some of the situations the social workers face. In one, it was a mother and an estranged son. And we just did a role play with two people the uh, psychodrama people actually staged, you are the mother, you are the son, you are the this, you are. In dance therapy, we work more with what we call the existential dimensions, like time and weight and space and flow. We just had them at opposite sides of the room and walked toward each other really slowly. And by the time they got to each other, they were crying. Even in the role play, everybody else was crying. The son turned away, the mother came around, the son turned away, the mother. and then they both sort of collapsed on each other's shoulders and were crying. And we just worked with space there. So again, you translate a situation into time, weight, space, and flow, and the movement dimensions, basically. Um, and we do a lot of role play with if you're the therapist, you're the client, coming directly versus coming from the side, how that feels, confrontation versus making an alliance. So we'll work with some of the nonverbals of how you are as therapist, too. So it's not just dancing, but it's these elements that are kind of universal and the nonverbals that are particularly important. Uh, after that, I went to, and I'm looking at Nader because the same tradition, um, did my doctorate at the University of Dallas, worked under Hillman and phenomenology there. So I'm very archetypal too. And then I've understood folk dancing as um, these ancient forms that are still important. And the more and more as the world gets more fragmented, more lonely, more of that, I think we really need these structures to help us stay organized in communities in um, connecting to each other and so forth. So a lot of people I see, I used to work with women with breast cancer at CPMC, and they would come in really just lonely, you know, in the illness, in the preoccupation. And so the connection with other people was more rhythmic. In the old days, we had quilting bees and barn raising, and we worked together, we ate together, we did all that in communities. So a lot of that's lost. And you can feel the hunger for connection that's not just sitting and talking often. There's another article, I didn't want to flood you, but I wrote one on action stories that when we do narrative and telling one's story is a big part of therapy, it doesn't have to be in words. There are all kinds of ways you can do a pantomime, you can demonstrate how you're feeling. So it is working with who am I and telling my story, but we don't have to think just words. We, we saw earlier artwork, other ways of getting to who am I and um, who am I to you? Um, so, that, so that's dance therapy. 
um, in 19, it's the, it's the youngest of the creative arts therapies. I think art therapy is the oldest. Um, music therapy was started kind of after World War II when they were called shell-shocked. The, vet, the veterans came back from the war often not talking, backward. So Oliver Sacks has written about this, that music reached parts of the brain that words couldn't. And because, as so often happens with the expressive arts or the creative arts therapies, um, you can work with people that others can't. That's how you sort of get useful in hospitals and places like that. So they discovered music was really important, so the music therapy became more, um, more accepted. The traditional creative arts therapies, I think, are art, music, dance, but we have poetry, we have drama therapy, we have psychodrama. Um, it's expanded. People now do photography therapy, you know, all kinds of other things. But the main associations are still art, music, dance. Now, expressive therapies, and correct me if I'm wrong, is newer. Um, I was, in fact, Steve Ross, who started one of the uh, International Expressive Arts Therapies, was, was with me at the Gestalt Institute with Laura Pearls. So in some ways, it has a phenomenological gestalt, very here and now emphasis, too. Um, there's different schools of it. For years, I've been teaching at Lesley University, and I have a student there who wrote his dissertation interviewing expressive arts therapists, like, what do you actually do? There's different schools. Um, at Lesley University, it was founded by uh, Sean McNiff, who's a music, who's an art therapist, and Paolo Nil, who's a music therapist. Their theory was an image is amplified, as you talk about working with dream images, best by crossing modalities. So the more you take it from words to art to song to the more it clarifies, the more intense it gets, the more you get insight from it. So, you, so in some schools, and that's called intermodal, you deliberately cross modalities. Dance, pure dance therapists pretty much stay with dance. In the old way, in the creative arts therapies, um, oh, we're good. Um, the theory was you sort of need your root discipline, like in dance therapy for two years, that's hardly enough time to really learn the body, to really learn different styles of dance, to really learn nonverbal communication, to really learn. So the, th the idea was really know where you come from, know where your roots are, if you're really an artist, if you're really, a, and because also the feeling is, I think like in many therapies, whatever it is, to avoid burnout, to renew yourself, you really need to keep doing your form, whether it's playing your music or doing your art or something or other, and that's really important. And for me, I often don't do it just to keep moving. So that's, that's the different creative arts therapies forms. In some of the articles, so I gave you two others. One is the Corsini, mm, am I talking too fast? I want to get to some movement, I know, but this is all introduction. In the Corsini Encyclopedia, one on dance therapy, it sort of summarizes it quickly. Um, basically, some of the history, some of the, the mission statement, uh, main principles that most dance therapists work with. By the way, I said my uh, background is Gestalt and archetypal because some are what they call Freudians and they've trained as psychoanalysts and they really look at, they use object relations, they use a different vocabulary. So my vocabulary is much more here and now, much more improvisatory. Um, what else? So that's that article from Corsini. The article about, uh, it was in the book on alternative and complementary methods, is on expressive therapies. And there I just tried to lay out a map of some of the different forms and their backgrounds and similarities and differences. And now each one has training programs, just again, so to speak to what might be some confusion about the whole field. Um, and then within the training programs, different people have developed versions. We have Natalie Rogers, we have Anna Halpern is still going in Tamalpa. All slight, vari some variations on some of these basic principles. Anna Halpern is what, 94? 92, if not 93. By the way, she's still doing, if you want me to forward you, she's still doing some, she was really a mentor to me. She broke her, she fell and she broke her pelvis about a couple of months ago, she's still up and dancing again. Her husband died 93. She's, she's pretty incredible. And she's doing some, I keep thinking it's the last opportunity, so I went, you know, I did a, an event with her 
recently, and she's still going. So if you get a chance, and maybe I'll send some of, the, some of these. To you. As far as she does a dance about eldering. That's just beautiful, about growing old, too. So uh, if you get a chance to see that, about growing old. We have to deal with aging bodies and limitations and all that, and that's a very real part of the work, too. If you can move one thing, what can that hand do? You know, becomes a whole focus in and of itself, a whole conversation. I was on a project at Columbia University, was doing a um, ethnographic study, and they were looking at Italians and Greek immigrants in New York over generations, and they all started with moving their hands a lot. And then over generations, they started moving less. And we say that, especially the Mediterranean cultures, tend to be close interpersonally, sort of in your face, a lot of touching, a lot of same-sex touching and holding hands, just walking down the street and so forth. More Northern Europe, well, you should know this, and, and, uh, and, and especially because Americans, so at least it used to be, uh, founded by Irish, um, Scottish, English, kind of Northern European folks, it tends to be much more, um, and then of course we've got this individualistic ethic here, much more this is my space, you know, don't, don't take my space. And it can be interpreted a lot as, you know, this is my space. And you heard Joanne talk about touching. Big subject, big subject. Um, just a quick take on that. If there's, a, if there's an issue like touching, my tendency is to not to try to solve it or second guess it, but to make an exploration about it. Um, I worked with these Taiwanese social workers. A lot of the girls were sexually abused. So we just worked with like uh, boundaries, like how close to come stop, you know. T so just to become more aware of the issues, all of us, um, because it's different for everybody and much more important to empower somebody to tell you what they're comfortable with than us knowing an answer. But yes, in this culture, we tend to be very, um, uh, held in physically and not expressive physically. Um, so yes, you have to be careful, although I'm always surprised, like in China, I've been going over, and once you get through the surface of sort of proper etiquette, everybody's all over each other and laughing, and you know, so I tend to think there's sort of universal human things just waiting. But I think that a lot of us are secretly lonely and don't even know how touch deprived we are and so forth, so you're always kind of, you know, listening for that too. Um, so I guess I've answered it. Yes, in this culture, we're, we're probably one of the most standoffish, um, but, but you work with that. Um, let me just then respond in some kind of a way of principle. Um, and this comes from Laura Pearls and Hillman, which is always working with polarities. So, so for example, one of my uh, most embarrassing moments in supervision with Laura when I said somebody came to see me and I was a new dance therapist and this young girl said, um, I want to be free, I want to be free. And she, she, uh, she said, I want to be free, I want to be free. And like a good Gestalt person, I said, can you show me? And she grabbed my hands and she started shaking for dear life. And I thought, holy cow, what do I do? So I just was as steady as I could, so forth and so forth. And then it kind of died down and it got quiet. And she left, and I thought, oh, that seems like a good session. And she never came back. So I said to Laura, what did I do wrong? And she said, if there's ambivalence, first respect the resistance, the part that doesn't want to approach, and give permission for that to be expressed. And then from there, she can begin approaching. But again, you're safe, develop your safe place first. If it's, and when we worked with autistic kids, it was like, how far are you comfortable until they sort of let you get closer and closer? So that's really a principle, but also to play with the polarities. So with a lot of people who are more able to express, we'll just do close and far. And just like, yes, yes, no, 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 no yes, no, here, yeah, yeah, yes. So again, you don't have to solve the problem once you see that there's an issue or problem. By, by playing it out as a polarity, you give people freedom of choice and just consciousness along some dimension. You tend to work with the opposites and make sure people have safety before moving towards you or just make conscious that both and, and then let them find comfort zones along the way. Even now, if we're doing this, I'll, I just might ask you if you would feel, and in Gestalt you say, would you like to try an experiment? Just notice your feet on the floor right now as you're standing. And you feel the floor under you. 
Can you feel your head pushing up the ceiling? And can you feel your whole spine and feet between the ceiling and the floor? Okay, so you feel your place, and this is your home base. I'll often, in a circle, have people find their home base first, bef even before we start moving. Sense of place, inner structure, establishing strength, centered breath, whatever it takes, even a moment to first give people a I'm here before moving off the safe place. In a circle, when I work with circles, I always work with the polarity of find your space, feel the hands, so you're in a community, but you're yourself. Because we all live in these very complicated negotiations between private space and communal space and group space. And one of the um, assumptions in dance therapy is it's a, it's a nonverbal snapshot of the way people are, not only this group, but therefore in their families, therefore in their other groups, therefore. So what you're seeing, somebody refuses to take the leadership, if you're passing it around, that says something about them. Somebody takes the leadership, doesn't give it up, that says something about them. Somebody can't quite go into the center and by the end of the group is in the center participating, that says something about progress over time. Because we have touch, we have eye contact, we have approach, we have interpersonal space, we have grounding. These are all things that come up in even talk therapy. So we'll keep an eye out on how they play out also there. Some of you know a lot of techniques, maybe from yoga, maybe from meditation, maybe from somatic work you've done. And so breathing, so some of these show up in lots of traditions like just taking a breath, taking a pause. We'll go over them anyway. Um, feeling your weight on the chair, feeling your feet on the floor, coming down from your mind more into your body, dropping your weight down. So I'll talk through, and I often will start a session that way. Um, uh, the, I guess the only thing I wanna say about movement is that all bets are off. But I worked with a woman with breast cancer who, I'm just thinking about this, who um, her main symptom was um, uh, just being out of her body, she would be um, lie in this uh, radiation strapped in the styrofoam thing with the blue light for four, and she would just leave her body. She'd just space out. And then she discovered she couldn't find her car key, she couldn't get home, she couldn't be a mother, she couldn't continue, you know, her normal, her normal activities after that. So we developed something that helped her reground, and it was more just a rocking, which is what autistic kids do. And she would actually do it in the waiting room before and after she went in for radiation just to remind herself to come back. So there are the standard ones, but I'm also a big believer in that you'll develop your own because we all have preferences or, you know, for some it's to go jogging before an exam, whatever it is, you'll find, you'll find something. And then, then I usually start sessions with a little bit of grounding and whatnot. And then again, just to kind of um, build on what Sue Ann said, sometimes I think of dance therapy as, you know, we are the instrument. You're gonna, this is a symphony here, but first you tune up the instrument, sort of a general principle working way towards, and then you begin to have some interactions, which I think of as dialogue or beginnings of songs, until those interactions like a, a dyad and a dyad and a dyad um, begin building bigger group formations till the whole group, and when the whole group is moving at once, it's kind of, I call it in the sacred, because something seems to take over, or numinous. Jung talked about numinous. When you're in a group that's really working together, it feels like there's no clear leader or no clear followers. Everybody's sort of creating something together. And that's very, very healing for everybody in the group. When you sort of get off your individual focus and problem focus and, what, and can partake in something bigger, that's healing for everybody. In the iTunes, I have basically fast music, slow music. I always use music. Not all dance therapists do. I find for this population, music is especially important because it really you know, communicates loudly and clearly. Um, just as a, uh, I'm talking a lot, but just as a sort of general principle, if you're working with um, the normal neurotic well, they often need the opposite of structure, no music, authentic music, listen to your own rhythm, listen to your own heartbeat, listen, you know, if you've been too structured in your life, whereas with people who need structure, it's just the opposite. A good and a clear rhythm. And I, you, I have a little bit of music that's sort of for relaxation. I have some for weight, 
and just a, um, a variety of different music on iTunes. I have some drums and some tambourines. Um, sometimes I'll take, I'll play a drum, but if people are able, and you'll see in the film, it's nice to have as much participation as possible. So you can hand these things out. I'll often um, keep them around kind of surreptitiously, and somebody, if they're not too focused on and don't feel like they're the object, will, will find themselves picking one up and starting to experiment with it. So you just kind of leave things around and let people play with them. Um, I have a series of rattles. These I just, I like to bring things back from trips. This is from Israel. It, it makes me smile. That's an Israeli artist. And this was from Cuba. And these guys I just brought back from APA in Hawaii. It's bamboo. Anything again that lets people know, hear me, hear me, I'm here, I'm here. Um, okay. I do often use um, in, in uh, high functioning groups or if they can a talking stick as you pass it around and do introductions or I'll do movement introductions. It's the same principle we did. Um, I found that if you pass this around and pretend it's a microphone, um, people will often be more succinct in their introductions. They won't hijack the whole group or you can kind of time it that way or pass it on to some, and it makes, it ritualizes the talking and the passing on. And even in a, again, this is a use of props, even in a regular group, it helps to have really these concrete objects that keep the focus on what you're doing. Why don't you close your eyes for a minute and take a moment and kind of think of, um, of a client that you work with here. We'll do a little sort of role play. Just try to get into the space of somebody you work with who you'd like to kind of explore some of the feeling of. When you open your eyes, do it slowly, still in touch with um, your inner client self, and kind of seeing the world outside you, but stay home inside this self you're exploring. If you can, just with your feet, see if you can find the rhythm. Can you add your hands? Can you move a little bit to the rhythm? Just side to side. Feel it in your body. And let's breathe. Just stretch. And back down again. And reach forward. See if you can re-find somebody across the circle. Ready, again. Find somebody else across the circle. Stretch your back. Back. Let's wake up our legs. And can you reach down? Say, good morning legs, all the way down. All the way up. How about your face? Anything else need warm up? Neck, shoulders, arms, so give yourself a little massage, how about just hands, wake them up, and stretch, let's see those hands. That's pretty. And maybe just 
just side to side. Like the waves of the ocean. Like conducting an orchestra. Like throwing something on the floor. Like throwing away problems. Mm, like throwing away tiredness. Like throwing away what? Anything else? Tension. Tension. Frustration. And pulling up good things, like what? Beautiful afternoon? Like what else? Self-love. Self-love. Like what else? Energy. Energy, absolutely. Like what else? Find somebody across and pull like a rope. Now take what you've taken. This is something very special and hold it tight and see what you got that was what you really wanted and just see what is this what did I take and let's see what we have here who wants to say what their special thing is lightness and playfulness, lightness and playfulness. bravo what else Learning from each other, love, and love, and love. What else? All right, take love, lightness, playfulness, um, energy, and what else? Take it in and just bathe yourself in it, and also cool down while we're at it. Take all that love, energy, playfulness, lightness, Last chance, anyone want to add anything? Happiness? Joy? And now feel it all around you. Let's just exercise legs. Let's walk into the middle of the circle. I'm back. And in, how far can you stretch your legs? And maybe uh, stretch out. Uh, and come forward. Again, okay, and just close your eyes for a minute, feel your weight on the chair, feel your feet on the floor, feel your spine balanced, upright, and just notice how you feel, is it 
compared to when you first started today or this training? Any changes? See if you notice any changes in your body, uh, tension, non-tension, heartbeat, breath. And then if you have any associations to the movements, what were they like? Intimidating, silly, fun, playful, meaningful. You feel a little bit exposed when you're moving to, or I feel a little bit exposed when I'm moving to music and there are people around, you know, it's like, it's this whole thing. But yeah, so feeling a little bit, like, vulnerable, but at the same time, like, feeling really good about the process of moving, too. There's something very enervating about it. You know, it's it like taps this primal sort of fun, like, you know, enjoyment that we have in moving rooms. Still in contact with yourself, but just seeing the faces around. Look to see who's in the circle. Great. wound up this morning, and now I feel you know, quite the opposite of that, you're quite loose and relaxed. Just to add to that, I just felt the whole mood or presence of the room shift from up here, energy level, to, I it just felt it in my body, more of a, I'll say relax for myself, just more into the body, uh, rather than we're all busy, and I just noticed that when we came to the room, and after doing this work, shifted for me the presence of the energy in the room and also for myself shifted more into the body and I'm, I'm feel more relaxed and I can actually feel more uh, blood flow through my fingers and uh, just more alive okay. but a relaxed alive. Good. I feel a lot more awake. I was worried at first when we were closing our eyes like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did it at the end. <laughs> um, Feel like Suzanne said, you know, feel the circulation going, mm -hmm. just the lightness. And, you know, I didn't feel started. Right. Mm -hmm. I feel happy. Mm -hmm. There's some more physiological processes really, really, really do affect your mood and your kind of perspective of things. You know, mm -hmm. and then just focusing on that shift from being tense and, and vaguely worried about things to not just because I was moving around, but like allowing things to flow and stretch. Just the interconnectedness of stuff in us is really fascinating. Um, so I'm curious about the role play. Did you get any more kind of insight into any of your clients or how you might work with them given even just this beginning? Some of it has to do with group setup. In, in one of the nursing homes I used to work in, we were lucky to have enough staff to kind of stand behind some of the residents and help them move. So it always helps the more healthy people you have in a group to help you so you're not carrying all the inertia yourself because that's a lot of, I don't want to say dead weight, but you know, to, uh, on a leader to have to keep up. Um, so having said that, if there's anybody you can use to help you, that's sort of one thing. Uh, yeah. The other thing is, as I said, you know, um, music, like those Indian bells, anything to amplify the hand. In one of the nursing homes I worked in, we had a man who was referred for depression, but he'd had a stroke, and um, I think he could use one hand, one arm, and everything else was paralyzed. Um, he was very, very depressed because not only did he have the stroke, but when he had the stroke, his wife left him, and uh, he was put in this nursing home. So from his point of view, he really had nothing to live for, and you know, half of what we do, you think we're just making people happy. Many have good reason not to be happy. So how do you work with that? So what we did with him was um, we learned that in his life before the nursing home, he'd been a teacher of woodworking at the high school, the local high school. At that point, I was consulting. Does anybody know Ellen Langer's work, L-A-N-G-E-R? She worked, she's at Harvard, and she works with consciousness being conscious. She did a pretty well-known experiment at the time. Two groups in nursing homes. One, the staff watered the plants in their rooms, and the other, they watered their own plants. And the ones who did for themselves did better, healthier, lived longer. 
So the, one of the principles, just to keep in mind, is empowering people who have been dis so badly disempowered. What we did with this man, we gave him a title. He was the keeper of the um, arts and crafts, the multi-purpose room that had plants in it, and his job was to water them. We strapped a watering can onto his wrist. And every morning he went in and he watered the plants like this. He started to perk up and do better. He, he got respected by the others. He was somebody. All those things started building. So again, the principle is whatever little bit of strength or movement or creativity you see, use that and build on it. So again, it would be particular to this person what, what it means to them to not be able to move. And if you can find some ways to start moving toward more self-respect, more autonomy, given whatever they can do, build on that. If I work with normal, healthy people, they don't need a lot of structure, activation, whatever it is. If I'm working with people who need a beginning structure, who need activation, I use it as a starting place. Often in groups, I'll start with music, and then the group will start making its own rhythm and its own whatever it is, and then I'll turn off the music and let the group carry its own self. I don't always use music either. But again, you know, when people need a lot of energy, structure, whatever it is, I'll start there. And you do have to be careful about imposing something. I try to use music that suits the mood of the group. So if, there's, if it's a grieving group, I'm not going to play marching music, you know. And again, that's kind of a clinical sensitivity to how to use the props to amplify what's, what you see there, not to impose something or not even to have a set of expectations that people should be active or should be moving or should be happy. So those are all the same clinical judgments any clinician would. So you're just using these things to support and, and kind of amplify and get things going. Again, this is, um, I may, and it may be confusing, work with you all kind of in the role play mode just to show you some of the sort of the fundamentals. Again, I use a really structured group and so forth. If you're working with other kinds of people, you may not use this at all. We may actually work with ourselves to just kind of, I think the other thing to work with is kind of along the lines you were saying is um, we pick up a lot of somatic countertransference. So even if we don't say anything, we may be feeling somebody's loss, grief, despair, joy, all connection to them, mother transferences, granddaughter, grandson transferences, all kinds of things that are implicit and sometimes have clear images of I'm being so-and-so's grandson at that moment and, some, and sometimes don't even get articulated. But they're often in the body. So there are ways in the body to just kind of debrief, de-roll. In psychodrama they say de-roll, come back to yourself. It's very important to sort of check in with yourself after a session and just see if you're carrying anything um, and then find a way to leave it in the room so you don't continue to walk around with it. I wanted to say one other thing about I'll, um, I'll sometimes um, use art too. I often have drawing materials around. There was a time uh, after, often after the relaxation where uh, imagery starts flowing and then you can put it on paper um, we used to work at, um, even in outpatient psychiatric, you know, asking people how their weekend was and there was a lot of silence and just doing a few warm-up exercises, how was your weekend started to flow. And the same thing with drawing, just would you like to draw versus doing, even just some stretching first, gets the blood flowing, gets emotions flowing, gets things, and then the drawing is often richer, more interesting afterward. So again, I'm not an art therapist, but I often keep drawing materials around just to sort of keep track, tracking the imagery and the feelings that are coming up as a way to sort of document them over time. I really encourage you to, um, to I don't want to say, feel free to be creative. I mean, this is your laboratory. It's a great laboratory. We can talk more, but the only things to be careful for, of course, are you know too much confrontation or intimidation if people can't do things, um, touch if it's not wanted. Uh, for, but but you know make mistakes and then we'll talk about them and just try things out in the group. Thank you. All right, good. Thanks. Have a good day. All right. Thanks. We'll continue. Good.